Welcome to our reflections on the Book of Revelation. We are continuing to reflect on the New Jerusalem, the New Heavens and the New Earth in chapter 21. And I want to begin at verse 10. So I want to read for you. In the Spirit, the Lord took me to the top of an enormous high mountain and showed me Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down from God out of heaven. It had all the radiant glory of God and glittered like some precious jewel of crystal clear diamond. Okay, let's look at that just for a moment. Uh, I have mentioned it briefly before that when uh, John was taken to see the uh, gaudy harlot in uh, chapter 17, he was taken to a desolate place, a place of spiritual uh, desolation. But now that he is seeing uh, the glory of God in man fully alive, uh, he is taken to a very high mountain and a place of great spiritual reality, spiritual glory. And we just want to remember for a moment that um, Jesus briefly showed his glory on Mount Tabor to three uh, of his disciples. And he left the earth in a blaze of glory from the Mount of Olives. But apart from that physical demonstration, we have the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 18, telling us that the path of the virtuous is like the light of the dawn and with the brightness growing to the fullness of day. So we're going to have that description here, that the, the path of the virtuous is like the light of the dawn and will grow to the fullness of day as people live in union with God, not just a few individuals here and there, but the whole group together. So in this city, we uh, actually witness the highest spirituality and the highest expression of religion that is actually possible on planet Earth. Here, what God asked in Leviticus 19.2 happens, you shall be holy for I am holy, says the Lord. In chapter 17, uh, we were shown the condemnation of the sin city. And now here in chapter 21, we see the exaltation of the holy city, the, the new city. And Jesus told us in Matthew 5.14 that the church is a city on a hill. Therefore, she can be seen by everyone. And this is uh, terribly important for evangelization, that when the world actually sees the glory of the church at this time, it will be quite easily uh, evangelized. Now, the purpose of the seven last plagues, as we said before, was to put everything back into God's order so that God's order could be expressed upon the earth. And it is from this new Jerusalem, from this new heaven on the new earth, that the blessings of God's order will go out to absolutely everybody who wants to participate. And in verse 11, just as the church was clothed with the sun uh, in chapter 12 and verse 1, now here she's clothed with the glory of God. That's the Shekinah the invisible but luminous presence of God is actually with her. And therefore she will be very, very attractive uh, to the people on the earth and they will want to come. When we were back in chapter four and meeting God just before the tribulation started, we were told that he, he was described as the jasper and the carnelian stones. These represented anger and judgment, but here, in this city where everything is according to God's will, you find that it's described as crystal clear diamond. In other words, everything is being transformed into light and God is light and our transformation is into him. Okay. St. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 6.16 that God dwells in unapproachable light. So if we are to come to him in heaven, we have to be transformed into light. So all of that very painful uh, preparation for this was actually necessary. Otherwise, we couldn't be transformed into light. So those who live in the new Jerusalem, the new church, the new heaven, which is on earth, will be living in his divine will. And they will be living the Our Father, that God's kingdom has come on earth and God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's, it's really very beautiful. I want to give you 1 Peter 2, 9. You are all sons of the light 
You see, everybody will be transformed into light to whatever degree that is God's will. Ephesians 5, 8, you were darkness once, but now you are light in the Lord. And the effects of light are seen in complete goodness and right thinking and right living. So uh, God is light. Uh, the people living in this uh, new Jerusalem are all being transformed into the light. And so God's glory, God's Shekinah, is no longer hidden. It is obvious. The Holy of Holies is no longer hidden away uh, with only the high priest able to actually go into the Holy of Holies. That is not so. Isaiah 2, 5 has, is fulfilled, and that is, all will walk in the light of the Lord. Everybody will walk in the light of the Lord. So I want to look at the walls of the city in verses 12 and 13. The walls of it were a great height and they had 12 gates. And on each of the 12 gates, there was an angel and over the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and the foundations were the 12 apostles. Okay, so the walls were of a great height. I want to look at that first. Why would they go to the trouble of telling you that walls were of a great height? Well, if you look at any of the ancient castles on earth, they always had very high walls and the high walls represent security. So in verses 12 and 13, uh, John wants to put across the great security that the people of God have at this particular stage because they have God's protection and they have God's favor on them. And because they have God's favor on them and God's protection, they are protected from everything. They're living very, very secure. Now, so we're not talking about physical security as in the high walls of the castles that people build on the earth. We're talking about spiritual security, okay? And so uh, the people will literally uh, be protected by the will of God, the presence of God, and the glory of God. And we're told about the gates leading into this city. Well, we know from John chapter 10, verse 9, that Jesus is the gate and nothing can get in that doesn't go through him. That's one of the securities of this city. So you'll find that the man who tried to sneak in to the wedding without the wedding garment, he was turfed out. The foolish virgins who didn't have oil in their lamps, they weren't allowed in. So there's no way you can actually get past uh, the gatekeeper. You have to go through Jesus. In other words, everybody in the city has to uh, allow the Lord to actually redeem them. They cannot have something according to their own designs. I do it my way. That's not how it is in the, the holy city. So there are 12 gates uh, and each one has a guardian angel. So these uh, 12 gates represent the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, while Jesus is the gate, he has people representing him. So the leaders of the church community or whatever you want to call it at this particular stage, I like calling it the resurrected church, they're doing their duty of protecting the kingdom of God. They're doing their duty to be on guard at the, the kingdom of God, that nothing untoward can, can come in. Do you remember back at the beginning of the book of Revelation, uh, Sardis was censored because uh, it had been uh, captured twice because it had no guard on duty. Well, the guards are on duty uh, in this particular uh, stage of the church. It's final manifestation, okay. And again, we're given the, the number, the 144,000, leaving the tribe of Dan out because the tribe of Dan had disappeared at an earlier stage. Okay. There are 12 foundation stones and these are the 12 apostles. So look at Ephesians 2.20. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So the walls of this city, the protection of this city has to be the gospel of truth. It has got to be that. And then we come to the measurement of the city, which I love in verse 15. Uh, the angel that was speaking to me uh, was carrying a gold measuring rod uh, to measure the city and the gates and the wall. The plan of the city was perfectly square in length as well as in breadth. 
Uh, he measured the city with his rod and it was 12,000 furlongs in length and in breadth and also in height. That means not square, but a cube. He measured its wall and there was 144 cubits high. The angel was using the ordinary cubit there. Uh, the wall was built of diamond and the city was of pure gold like polished grass. The foundations of the city wall were faced with all kinds of precious stones. And he names some of these precious stones. So let's deal with some of this. John is going into a great deal of, of uh, uh, detail here, but I want to look at the measurement first. I, I think the measurement is beautiful. When you go back to chapter 11 of the book of Revelation, you find that John was given a measuring rod to measure the church, but it certainly wasn't gold because the church at that stage was not ready to be a dazzling bride. No way. It was the measure of sin that was in the, the so-called holy city that was there. But it is very different here where we have the resurrected church and uh, the people of God living at the highest level of their being. And so they are measured by the gold standard of heaven. I think that's beautiful. And not only are they measured by the gold standard of heaven, but the measurement is correct. There's nothing wrong in the measurement. There is no sin in this city. That's what is so absolutely beautiful about it. And then he goes on to describe the city in a very interesting way. First of all, he says it's a square, and then you realize it has a, a, a third dimension, which means it's a, a perfect cube. And you have to realize that back at the time of John, uh, mathematics was d developing very uh, quickly and they uh, realized that the cube was the most perfect structure. Okay, but if you go back in history to the time of Nineveh, uh, they thought that the most perfect uh, dimension on the earth was a square. So you find that uh, Nineveh and Babylon were both built as square cities because they thought that was the most perfect thing. But John is saying that they were on uh, the level of earth and earthly, but this city has a spiritual dimension. So it's not just square on the horizontal level, it has this spiritual dimension. It's a perfect cube, uh, which is very interesting. But the measurement he gives is absolutely extraordinary. He says it's uh, 12,000 furlongs length, breadth and height. Now, if you translate that into miles, it's about 1,500 miles in length, in breadth and in height. Now, a city falling down physically from heaven of that dimension would be a major catastrophe on the earth. But the distance, I just want to give you a sense of distance and I'll give you a few of them depending on what part of the earth you're actually living in. It's the distance between London and Athens. It's the distance between New York and Houston, if you're living there. It's the distance between Delhi and Ragoon, if you're living there. And it's the distance between Adelaide and Darwin, if you're living there. Now, anybody in any of these areas knows that's a fantastic distance, okay? And to have a city of that length, of that breadth and of that height, that means you're talking about a global reality. And so just as the church at the time when she desperately needed to be purified, was a global reality. So when she rises from the dead, she's a global reality. Do you remember when Jesus rose from the dead? He could be anywhere at the same time. He had lost the limitations of just being in the flesh. And so he had all the, the uh, freedom of the spirit. He could be anywhere at any time. And this church is in fact the presence of God on the earth. It's the kingdom of God on earth. It's a perfect cube. It's, uh, you need to just remember that the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle that Moses set up was a perfect cube. Small example of what the final reality of the people of God on earth was going to be like. And so the more we study the tabernacle that Moses set up in the desert, the more we actually understand the reality that's here in the uh, book of Revelation at the very end. So this is not an earthly city just on two dimensional, therefore it's not just square. It has this spiritual dimension. It's absolutely perfect. Okay. And so John is giving you um, symbolic ways of 
actually trying to describe something that is perfect in God's eyes and spiritual. And then in verse 17, he gives a, a measurement that seems to contradict uh, a, another measurement he gives. And so he's actually talking about the thickness of the wall, that it's 144 cubits. And of course, he uses the famous 144, the 12 squared. OK, so let's move on from there. And uh, we now look at the composition of the walls, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, so this is verse 18. Uh, the wall was built of diamond and the city of pure gold or polished uh, glass. It was like polished glass. So like polished glass looks awfully like that uh, glass uh, in front of the throne of God, uh, as was described back in chapter 4. The composition of the walls is diamond and gold. That means diamond represents light and gold represents fire. So it actually represents the way God himself is described by both Ezekiel and John. Light and fire. And so the church is holy and without blemish as Paul described in Ephesians 5 and verse 27. And we have the foundation stones now in verses 19 and 20. The foundations of the city wall were faced with all kinds of precious stones. The first was diamond, the second was lapis lazuli, the third was turquoise, the fourth was crystal, the fifth was agate or onyx, uh, the sixth was ruby, the seventh was gold quartz, uh, the eighth was malachite, the ninth was topaz, the tenth was emerald, the eleventh was sapphire, and the twelfth was amethyst. Why do they go to that amount of trouble? Why does he actually describe particular foundation stones? Well, again, you've got to go back to the tabernacle in the wilderness. And when the high priest was standing before the presence of God in the tabernacle, he wore a pectoral. OK, sometimes they call it a rational. And on it was 12 precious stones. And each one of those precious stones represented one of the tribes of Israel. The emerald represented the tribe of Judah from which Jesus was going to come. And the reason for that was that the people of God are precious in his eyes. That is regardless of whether they are sinful or holy. They are precious in his eyes. They are his people. And that's that. And so here we're being told about the preciousness of the foundation stones, the 12 apostles and how precious it is that God was able to turn perfectly ordinary people into such giants of the spirit as he managed with the 12 apostles, having replaced Judas uh, when he failed. OK, uh, so the people of God are very precious in his eyes. Now, verse 21 says the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate being made of a single pearl and the main street of the city was pure gold and transparent as glass. Aha, here you have the sea of glass again uh, that was introduced to us in uh, chapter four. So the preciousness of this community is being described in the only language that John has. He's not able to get across uh, the, the language that he wants to. Now, we know from Matthew 13 verses 45 and 46 that Jesus compared the whole kingdom of God to a precious pearl that a person would be prepared to sell everything to, to get this. And here you have uh, each of the gates is of immeasurable value. Now we know the names that are on the gates. These are the 12 uh, tribes of Israel that in other words, the sheer preciousness of the people of God is being brought uh, into our uh, attention here. And of course, streets paved in gold is anybody's image of a sort of utopia or heaven, whatever you like. And the, the pure gold that is in the church are the divine truths that the people are living on. And that's what's transforming them. And that is what's transforming the world. That's what's healing the earth. And that is what is uh, bringing uh, this whole reality uh, into uh, focus here. And so the church holds the treasury of God in the Holy Scriptures. 
in the teaching of the magisterium, in the revelation given to us by the saints. Uh, this is all the transparent truth that enables us to live at the highest level of our being. And therefore, the whole reality is utterly, utterly precious in the eyes of God. Every single truth that he has given to us is a treasure beyond price. And we need to actually begin picking up these treasures and putting them into our hearts and into our being so that these treasures bring forth their supernatural fruit that they were meant to bring and therefore that they will be able to transform the world. Thank you for listening. Slona Gusbanak they live. Goodbye. God bless you. Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.